also start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to, to come. And also I'd like to thank um, Ileana especially and Phil and some of the speakers who've done a lot of um, great talks that have mentioned rigidity and so have made the first part of my talk much easier. So I'll be able to go a bit faster through um, the first part. Um, my perspective on rigidity is, is a little bit different to what we just heard from Ileana. I, I'm very much um, a combinatorial person. I like graphs, I like matroids, so I, I always assume my frameworks are generic, and then I'm interested in trying to understand as a purely a property of the graph when in the framework is rigid or globally rigid. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about to start with is just bar joint frameworks, and I'll tell you a little bit about rigidity and global rigidity. Most, if not all, you've already heard, so I'll go relatively fast, but please stop me and ask questions if I go too fast. Um, and then what I'm interested in is what I call linearly constrained frameworks. So these are frameworks that I'm asking, I have my points and I have the distances, but then before I ask if it's rigid or not, I also say that some vertices have additional constraints. So maybe some vertices are, are pinned and some vertices are restricted. Say I'm in three dimensions, some vert vertex is restricted to move on a fixed plane. Or if I'm in two dimensions, maybe some vertex is restricted to move on a fixed line. And in this sort of slightly more general context is where I'm gonna try and explain to you our work recently on global rigidity, especially in this, this context. Okay, so as we all know, by now a framework, you take your graph and you realize the vertices into Euclidean space. This induces fixed lengths for any edges and you're interested in when you can deform your, your structure, when you can change the shape. So for example, if I have a, a square or just a four cycle graph, most of my pictures are in 2D and I've probably drawn them less generically than I should, but they, I don't think it causes any, any harm. Um, so this one is flexible because I can change the distance between the opposite diagonals and move it across to something like this. If that, what that meant was there was a family of continuous functions I could assign to the vertices that moved the one to the other, preserving the graph structure and preserving the edge lengths. If there's no such thing, so every edge length preserving continuous motion of the vertices comes just from translations, rotations, and reflections, then the thing is called rigid or continuously rigid. So as we've seen uh, yesterday, this is an example of one that is rigid. I've put the diagonal in, but I can flip one across to the other. So this is rigid, but it's not globally rigid. There exists distinct realizations with the same edge lengths. And so it's globally rigid if you're unique apart from translations and rotations. So in particular, if every other framework with the same edge lengths arises from an isometry of the space, then we say it's globally rigid. So quickly, again, here's some examples in the plane. So an easy one to see that's flexible. You can imagine this vertex as pinned, and then this vertex moves on a circle centered at that vertex. So that's nice and easy. This one is rigid, so one way to see that is to start with your complete graph, which is rigid, the K4. And imagine I've done this twice, so I had two different centers for two different circles for this vertex being adjacent to the, the K4. So those two circles will intersect in a finite number of points. So if I pick one of those as a position for it, then I can't continuously move from it to any of the others and do the same for this one. So that's rigid. It's not globally rigid because I can do some reflection. So just like the example we had before, I could reflect or I could pick this two vertex separation here, this vertical pair and reflect in the line through that edge and move everything over to the other side. So you can start to count how many realizations, but it's more than just one after you've factored out your isometries. And this one, I, I probably won't just say anything to justify it, but if to ask you to believe me that in the plane, this one is an, a non-trivial example of something that's globally rigid. It's an example of what F Phil said uh, yesterday about adding exactly one edge to a minimally rigid thing that gives you a, a globally rigid um, framework. Uh, just, yes? These are graphs, okay? Yes. But if I take them as realizations, yes. there seems to be a lot of risk of, uh, of uh, non-genericity. Right, because you, you've drawn them really square. So I, I've drawn them very square, but you can always draw the, the points you as generically can. as you like. So if you reflect those things, you will have superposed vertices. And this is not strictly forbidden, but it seems like something that should be forbidden in a way. Okay. So, so I, I'm always interested in the generic, and if I'd drawn them generically, then the reflection wouldn't These have been overimposed. Okay. Yes. Okay. But I mean, it's close enough to being something that you can no, understand. Just, just a curiosity. Okay, so um, I'm a mathematician, so I don't do applications really, so, but I felt left out this week here in lots of nice applications, so I've thrown in a few pictures that I'm gonna say <laughs> almost nothing about, um, just show you 
nice pictures. So this is a, a structure at the University of Kent that was built. Use, it's actually a more general structure than a framework where edges can um, change their length. Both some can increase, some can decrease, and some have to stay the same. Um, this is we, we've heard about um, sensor network localization, and I think we'll hear some more today. Um, control of robotic formations. So Ileana had a nice video of a, a robot. This is um, formation of autonomous little robots that sense each other. Um, bridges, obviously, and this is. Um, uh, layers of vitreous silica, and really this is more relevant to what I'm going to do because here there was some kind of boundary conditions where these blue vertices were pinned, and the green around the outside was a was sort of a different thing where instead of pinning the blue vertices, you could you can notice every alternate one where they looked at um, putting a one-dimensional constraint, so a linear constraint on each of the boundary vertices instead, so the two different ways, which is sort of relevant to what I'm going to be, be doing. Um, I think this entire slide, Ileana explained nicely. So we have infinitesimal motion is a vector assigning instantaneous velocities to your vertices, which satisfies a dot product condition. This gives you a system of linear equations, and then you can form the, the matrix of coefficients of this system, and that's the rigidity matrix. Um, and the framework is infinitesimally rigid, either if the only infinitesimal motions come from isometry, so infinitesimal translations, rotations, or reflections, or equivalently, if this matrix has the right rank, which is the, the number of columns minus the dimension of the Lie group of isometries. So this is a thing you've heard before. Um, generic, uh, to me, means something slightly different to what we heard earlier. So I like to put the, basically the strongest possible condition of generic I, I can, and then it just allows me to do combinatorial things. This may not be um, so satisfactory to, to everyone, but to, to me, it, it makes things easier. And the reason I, I'm going to say this throughout, so this is just a, a strong condition, it's technical, so I won't say much more about it, but there are certain points in the, the proofs where I have to rely on this actual strength of, of generic. In this result, for example, it's way too much. You can get away with m much weaker conditions, but there are some results later where I need this one. So rather than trying to worry about which version I needed each particular result, I've just thrown the sort of hammer at the problem to start with in the slides. Actually necessary. I, mean, I, I can tell you when I get to the yes, state of exactly. the theorem, but I can't tell you the detail without okay, talking okay. for a lot longer. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, you might have to ask at the end if I forget, but I will okay. try and remember. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you the um, so we, we saw before Ileana had these nice pictures of where rigidity and infinitesimal rigidity don't coincide. In the generic case, Asimov and Roth proved that they do, and so whenever I say rigid later on, I'm probably meaning technically infinitesimally rigid, but it's sort of intuitively you can think rigid, but when I'm working with it, I'll be working with infinitesimal rigidity. Okay, so we had Le Mans theorem already, so um, Ileana called this Mac Maxwell sparse counts. Um, I, I think this was actually, Ileana introduced this terminology of two free tight, some point that I, I really like, so I go for, for this one. So. In general, you could have a K and an L, and so the K is the scale of the number of vertices, so that's going to correspond to the dimension, and the L, or the three here, would be the D plus one choose two, the number of isometries for the space. But you can also then, with a general K and L, you can make it more general, and a bit later, if I have time, I'll say something about when some, this isn't just um, D and D plus one choose two. So this example just illustrates that you do need the hereditary <laughs> subgraph inequality, so you do this, need this to hold for all induced subgraphs. For example, these have exactly the same number of edges. They both meet the, the count, but I've moved this one edge across to here, and I've gone from something that's minimally rigid to something that's flexible because I've spread the edges in a, a bad way around the structure. And then the characterization of generic rigidity in two dimensions um, is that you're rigid if and only if you contain a spanning subgraph, which has this property, or you're minimally rigid if you are exactly too free tight. Okay. And as Ileana said, in three dimensions, it's really hard and we don't know what to do. In particular, the, the, she showed examples where the analogous three six tight statement fails. So three dimensions and higher is really important and interesting. Um, one slide on global rigidity in the bar joint case. So I need one extra definition. So um, a graph is redundantly rigid if when I delete any edge, it's rigid, so I have to be able to throw away any edge and still have a spanning two free tight subgraph. So for example, if I have a degree two vertex, I said before when you add a degree two, that could 
keeps you rigid in the plane, but now it doesn't keep you redundantly rigid because I delete any edge incident to it, and then that degree one can move around. So one trivial thing is it implies you have degree three as a minimum. Um, this is the characterization of global rigidity in the plane. And again, in dimension three or higher, the natural analog is false, and giving a characterization is completely open. So the theorem splits into, well, okay, so there's a, a small bit that if you're a complete graph, then you're always globally rigid. And then, if, but if we forget that, and suppose we have at least four vertices, then Bruce Hendrickson showed that if you're globally rigid, then you must be free connected and redundantly rigid. If you're not free connected, then there's two vertices. And as in one of the examples I showed before, you can just flip one part of that over through the line through those two vertices in the plane and you get an equivalent but um, distinct realization. Hendrickson's paper talked about almost all frameworks rather than generic to improve his result, to, to, well, to, to adapt his result to actually say generic rather than you're almost all somehow missing some generics and mid others then that argument does, the way I understand it, need algebraic independence. Connolly showed that the that a stress matrix, the stress matrix is um, takes the Laplacian matrix of a graph, and instead of having a minus one when i is adjacent to j, then the minus one is changed to minus some weight, and the weight comes from the rigidity in some sense. I'll say a little bit more about that if I have time later. Connolly showed that this matrix having full rank was a sufficient condition for global rigidity. And again, in that proof, the only way I know how to do it, you need generic and algebraic independence there. So they're the two points in the Euclidean case where generic really needs the strength of the full thing. Everything else, I think, is um, a regular or a weaker condition would be okay. And then how does, does that help? Well, so Jackson and Jordan gave a, a constructive characterization of graphs which are free connected and redundantly rigid. What they proved was you can get every such graph from the complete graph from four vertices by two operations, apply them iteratively. Um, the first operation was called one extension or a Henneberg two move. It, it subdivides one any edge, and then the new degree two vertex you get, you join to one other place in your graph. And the second operation was just adding edges. So the second operation clearly preserves global rigidity. To show the first one preserved global rigidity, Connolly used his um, stress matrix sufficient condition. So that's how it, and then by induction with those ideas, you complete this proof. And that, that's all I want to say about um, Euclidean global rigidity in the bar joint case. And so I want to tell you um, for the rest of the talk about linearly constrained frameworks, but maybe before I do that, did I go too fast? Does anyone want to hear um, or ask me a question to clarify any of the bar joint stuff that you've heard a few times already. Okay, great. Okay, so linearly constrained frameworks. So as I said, what I'm gonna do is add additional constraints at some of the vertices. So I'm gonna model these by having graphs which have loops. So before, all my graphs were, were simple because a loop would say something about the distance between a vertex and itself, which doesn't make much sense, or a parallel edge would say, you've constrained this distance and now constrain it again, so again, it didn't make much sense. Parallel edges still won't make sense, but now we are gonna have loops, and I've separated them out just to make it um, more clear, so we have the, the edges and the loops as two different sets. Um, and then my linearly constrained framework, same as before, I have my graph and I realize the point, the vertices as points into some Euclidean space. And now I also have a vector Q or a map Q that realizes the, the loops. And so what it effectively does is I say I'm in the plane and I have one loop at this vertex and I realize the, the loop as telling me that this vertex must move on, the, on some fixed line. So the line is fixed ahead of time and I move my vertex on that line. So what do I do? I, infinitesimally, I, what I want to think about is that an infinitesimal motion of this vertex should move me along the line. And our infinitesimal motions, we have this dot product condition. So what I want is it to be orthogonal to the normal to the, the line. So in general, in RD, I'm gonna have a hyperplane and I want my Q to be the, the normal to that hyperplane at the point of the vertex that it lives at. So I think that's what I say here, yeah. So it represents a normal, QI is a normal vector to the hyperplane that contains that particular vertex. And those hyperplanes I give you ahead of time and they, they all live there. And then I want to say with those fixed hyperplanes, can I move my framework around on those hyperplanes in a continuous or later in a non-continuous way? Okay, so, so I guess 
one more thing. Um, so maybe this is slightly philosophical, but uh, this, a triangle is clearly rigid in 2D. I'm going to define this framework to be flexible in the linearly constrained context. So what I've done with the linear constraint is I've ruled out the translation, the vertical translation, right? So I can rule out the isometries that I couldn't do before. So now I think of this as having a two-dimensional space of motions. One is the rotation centered at this point. See, so it's going to just rotate around. And one is the translation in the x direction along this line. So they are now, to me, non-trivial motions. So I want for it to be rigid, I want it to not move. OK. To the end, but it might be better now. So, um, in the case of trying to find structures with uh, intervals, quite often we're looking at motion along uh, curves, not straight lines. Yeah. So, if we were going to gen generalize what you're going to discuss to that case, is it straightforward or is it, is it considerably hard? So, what, what I'm really doing infinitesimally, I think, um, it, it's Certainly, if, if your curves were circles or, or spheres, then it's easy because to constrain your vertex to move on, on a sphere of whatever dimension, infinitesimally, you want the infinitesimal motion to move in the tangent plane to that, that sphere. And so these lines are really tangent, tangent lines to, to circles. So in, in effect, you can think about what I'm doing as I'm moving infinitesimally the vertices on circles, but the circle is centered at infinity, and it's a projective kind of thing. For global rigidity, the, t the two things are not quite the same. There's sort of a single vertex as a, as a counterexample, but otherwise they might be the same. I just, I don't know how to prove that. And so infinitesimally, yes, you can definitely think that way. Okay, so I said before this triangle with one linear constraint wasn't rigid. Here's enough linear constraints to make it rigid. So I've ruled out the, the two isometries by having two linear constraints at this vertex because I have, I'm generic, so the linear constraints are never going to be parallel or anything like that. So I'm always taking two hyperplanes, intersecting them, and getting a lower dimensional affine space. And so if I have enough linear constraints at a vertex, so in the plane having two, then I pin a vertex. That would just allow a rotation around this center, but this linear constraint rules that out. So this is rigid. It's not globally rigid for me because I can take these two vertices and reflect through that line and move this vertex over to here somewhere. So we'll just reflect through the, the line through the two vertices constrained by the linear constraints. So this is rigid, but not globally rigid. OK, so, and again, generic in the linearly constrained thing, I'm actually going to throw even more strength at it by saying that not just are the p's algebraically independent, but also the, the q's are as well, and the entire list of p's and q's. It, you can get into a game where you don't have this. For example, as I said um, to the question, um, you can talk about frameworks on a surface, which are highly non-generic, and then the linear constraints are the tangent planes. So that would be one way of weakening Q from being algebraically independent and say all of these Q vectors actually are the tangent planes to some nice surface and then asking the same sort of questions. Some of those surfaces I can do and some I can't, but it's not, not what I want to say today. Um, okay, so infinitesimal motions are my linearly constrained framework. So this is exactly the same condition from earlier, and then the additional condition I said about you want your infinitesimal motion to be orthogonal to the normal to the hyperplane that you're restricting that vertex to. So this is straightforward. So this matrix of coefficients, has, uh, linear system has a matrix of coefficients. It's a usual rigidity matrix for these ones, and there's just extra rows for these constraints. So for each loop, there's an extra row. If the loop is at a vertex vi, then it's Row is zero everywhere except in the column for v VI, the column D tuple, where the entry is the normal vector. So it's nice and simple addition to the matrix. And we can express infinitesimal rigidity again as being the only infinitesimal motion is the zero motion. We can never get rid of zero being in the kernel, um, but we can't have anything else. Or if the rigidity matrix just has full column rank. So it's a nice, simple infinitesimal rigidity characterization that we can then try and do something combinatorial from. Um, I think I probably don't have time to say 3D examples. Oh, I should point out that because I'm completely um, immobilizing a framework or saying there's no um, infinitesimal motion far from the zero motion, my graph doesn't have to be connected to be rigid anymore. If I, if I lock this thing over here and this thing over here, the two disconnected things, then there's nothing wrong with that. For example, if I just have a load of pinned vertices, then there's no edges, so I, we don't need graph connectivity anymore, which is going to cause a complication later.
So again, a few more pictures motivated by applications. So when people look at rigidity, quite often they actually look at these extra constraints. So people looked at um, synthesis of mechanisms in mechanical engineering. So these symbols were their way of denoting pinned vertices. So this was um, in the context of a sewer graphs, if you're familiar with that. Um, just general basic mechanical engineering where they're looking at slider joints is exactly what we're, we're doing. And again, I mentioned this one before. So people have looked at, at this already. So in particular, Ileana and Louis Ferran have a, a really nice theorem which characterizes rigidity in the two-dimensional case for these frameworks. So what they said was, you can see this is just saying is rigid if and only if something. And so it's just like Le Mans theorem except you have in your, your top count your number of edges plus loops, and you don't have the minus three because those trivial motions went away. You have the same inequality as you had in your top count, but then they have a second condition. So it's possible that you just have edges and you want to count what happens there. And so the thing, re reason I think this theorem is really nice is because they have these two different inequalities. So in the technical it's a way of saying it technically is that you have flexible circuits, which is a, one of the, the problems in 3D rigidity. But in this context, even though they have flexible circuits, so a circuit, a subgraph with no loops, which just violates this inequality, mi minimally violates this inequality. But even in the presence of them, they were able to characterize rigidity. So this is a, a really nice result. And I basically want to tell you an analog of it for, for global rigidity. There was some other prior work. So for example, the, the picture I said about graphs gave a, a slightly weaker result around the same time. Then there was some work on making the, this effectively the pinned vertices non-generic and some um, partial work on um, spheres and projective versions of this kind of thing. So how long do I have to say about global? Okay, All right, so the, the key thing for global rigidity is to remember that I'm taking the, the Q as fixed. So I have this fixed set of, of hyperplanes, but I'm, I want to see, is there another P? So, and with that, it's just basically the same as before. So I have this unique, this realization of my, my graph as a linearly constrained framework. Is there any other possible way of doing it? So how to, to create some examples. One thing is you could take a bar joint framework, which is globally rigid, and if I add enough loops, enough linearly constraints, so if I add, D plus one choose two, plus one more lin linear constraints across at least D different vertices, then this will give me a globally rigid thing because what they're doing is ruling out all the isometries and then have one more to make it redundant at the end. And a trivial example is just to take a load of isolated vertices and pin them all. And then in the middle you can do more complicated things. So example here is a, a bar joint framework you see this has a, a degree one vertex. This is a flexible bar joint framework on five vertices. And then I've added these five linear constraints. And I want to try and at least intuitively convince you that this one is globally rigid. So let me start at this vertex over here. So it's got two linear constraints, so that's pinned. So that's okay. And what it means is that this vertex adjacent to it moves on a circle centered here. So this is just moving around like that. Effectively, as I said in answer to Phil's question, that means this is moving on the, the tangent um, line to that circle. So effectively, I could replace, remove this vertex and its linear constraints and just add one linear constraint here. And effectively, the rigidity is the same in both contexts. It's not quite true globally, but we prove it is actually true for this particular kind of operation. So the global rigidity of that thing I had before is equivalent to the global rigidity of this one. Then this one's much easier to understand. This one's pinned because of the two linear constraints. This is a minimally rigid framework, so all it can do continuously is rotate, send it here. This linear constraint here fixes that rotation, and all that's left is a, a flip of this vertex around, which is ruled out by this last one. So this becomes globally rigid, and hence this one is globally rigid. And so you can play this sort of game um, <coughs> as much as you like, but we want to just say, purely by looking at the graph, when is it globally rigid? So I need two more definitions. Um, and basically, it's analogs of what you had before. So we had redundant rigidity. Now I need to be ri rigid after I remove any edge, but also after I remove any loop as well. And I want to be rigid as a linearly constrained thing. And then I mentioned you had this free connectivity condition where if you weren't free connected, there was two vertices you could flip apart. 
the analog of that is a condition that's more, it's similar, but it's based on the loops. So we say that the graph is balanced. And there's a two here. If I wanted to say it in RD, then it's still true. I just make D balanced with a D there instead. So it's balanced if for every set of two vertices, if I delete those two vertices in every incident edge, then the, remain, the graph I have that remains has a loop in every connected component. So I'm no, I'm not saying that x is a, a two vertex separation. So it might be that g minus x is still connected in the end, but it has to have a, a loop in every connected component that it does have. So that last sentence I just said, I wanted to illustrate again here because what this is is showing is that the there is an equivalent but non-congruent realization if I have all my loops across just two vertices. So I can take, again, the line through those two vertices. This one goes over here, this one goes over here. So it's a second different realization. So I really need to spread my loops around um, at least three vertices in the plane. So here's our theorem. The characterization says, it roughly says that you're globally rigid if and only if you're balanced and redundantly rigid, but because graphs don't need to be connected to be globally rigid, there's a, a, a little complication where you have to look at the connected components. And then there's one exception that if you have a single vertex with two loops and that, those two linear constraints pin that vertex, but it's not redundantly rigid. Because if I delete one of those loops, then there's just a single line that the vertex can move along. So that's not redundant. So I have to have that or a redundantly rigid thing as each of my connected components. OK, so um, I want to say that I, this, this comment um, I'm not going to dwell on, but it, it extends the result to instead of saying a unique realization to in a special case counting the number of realizations. But I don't want you to worry about what it is. I'm, I say it for the specific reason that by saying it, it allows me to um, say that this our results generalize the bar joint characterization. So it's not obvious that the bar joint characterization is a special case of this for global rigidity. But if you do this, it, it isn't. So maybe that's too vague, but I don't have time to really say too much. I want to say in the rest of the talk a little bit about each of the three steps. And it's, it's sort of similar to the, the Euclidean case. So I have a Hendrickson kind of step. I have a stress matrix kind of step. And then I have a combinatorial kind of step. So I'll say a little bit about each one. So Hendrickson condition very quickly. So if you're globally rigid, then you must have this balance condition. So the balance condition said that can you f was asked, can you find two vertices that if you take them away, you find a connected component with no loops. So this one, you can find a component over on the right here with, with no loops. So this is not balanced. And because it's not balanced, I'm saying it's not globally rigid by just taking my realization is a linearly constrained framework and reflecting through the line through u and v. So the right-hand side gets reflected over, and there's my second realization. So that's easy. Redundant rigidity. Effectively, Hendrickson's proof, we, we just adapt. So Hendrickson's proof says, if you're rigid but not redundantly rigid, there's some edge I can delete which makes you flexible. You get rid of the isometries by however you like in the Euclidean case. And then you prove that this, the configuration space is a one-dimensional manifold. And then you need to check that it's a, a compact manifold. And then from there, it's easy to finish. For, for us, the configuration space isn't always compact. So there's a slight complication. So here's an example of a, a graph which is rigid. So here's one realization. But if I delete the edge incident to this red vertex, then it, it's, V2 is, is free to move up and down this line. And so that configuration space is, is topologically is just a line rather than a, a circle, so it's not bounded. You can see over here the second realization you get by, by doing this motion. So this is not globally rigid. And then in, in Hendrickson's argument, so we needed a lemma to, to fix exactly when, with what condition we needed to say that the configuration space was bounded. And it's just enough of these linear constraints in each connected component. And I'm being vague again, but it, with, with that, we can, we can um, basically apply Hendrickson's original proof almost directly just by like this lemma plus one paragraph explaining how this lemma makes it work. OK. So I, I now know that these conditions are necessary for global rigidity. I want to know they're also sufficient. So what I want to do, again, is a recursive construction. I have some operations which, characterize, which generate all balanced redundantly rigid graphs. And then I want to show that those operations preserve global rigidity. So the first part I'm going to explain is 
how we show that last bit. And the way we show the preserved global rigidity is to show that there is a, a stress matrix and the rank of the stress matrix is sufficient to, to deduce global rigidity. And then you say that you, if you have a maximum rank stress before your operation, and af then you can prove you have one after your operation. And that last bit I'm going to ignore, but I'm just going to show you the, the stress matrix and the, the theorem. Okay, so stresses are vectors in the the co-kernel rigidity matrix, so infinitesimal motions are vectors in the kernel rigidity matrix, and stresses in the, the co-kernel, because we have these extra rows for the, the loops, we have an extra condition. So this is the usual stress condition that this first sum is equal to zero. We have to add the loops, and so each weight on your loops times by the normal vectors sh should be added to the, the weights on the edges. So another way of saying this is that the sum of the weights on the edges should be in the direction of the, the normal vectors weighted appropriately. Okay, so then it's exactly the same stress matrix, so it's a Laplacian matrix where the, the entries are, are weighted by the, the entries of your, your stress vectors. The, I guess the, this is a symmetric matrix where every row sum is equal to zero, so the all ones vector is always in the the kernel of the stress matrix, so we can never have full rank, we always have mod b minus one. And unlike the Euclidean case, we have no affine motions anymore, so that this is actually achievable, the v minus one. Same stress matrix as Euclidean case, but we can achieve a higher rank because of our linear constraints and the, the altering of the definition of stress. And so even though I'm talking about um, arbitrary dimension d here, but there's no d in the rank because the the dimension is hidden in the, the choice of the, the little omega lambda that your stress matrix depends on. Okay, so with that, let me just very quickly say that having a, a full rank stress implies global rigidity, and this is the real point where I think it would be really hard if you tried to weaken algebraic independence. Um, I'll miss the last comment because I want to say something brief about um, combinatorics in the two minutes I think I have left. So. In Ileana and Louis Ferrand's result, they had these two kinds of um, inequalities, and this leads us to having two kinds of, of graphs we want to deal with for us. So we, we start with the special case where our balanced redundantly rigid graph is, is a circuit, so it's a minimal dependent set in the matroid sense. I don't have time to say matroid, so s sorry about that. The circuits in their result are just graphs. Well, they're usually edge, set, edge sets, but let me just say they're graphs. They could either have the sort of standard condition or they could have our looped condition, but let's not worry about what they are. And let's just say the, the first type are ones like this, which have no loops and so, so they can move, so they're called flexible circuits. And the second type have at least four loops. They could have more, but they look something like this and they're rigid. And then, so we want to turn um, balanced and redundantly rigid into, a, into something we can deal with, so here's a, a simple matroid definition. That's, it's really a definition about graphs for us. So we can say our graph is connected in the matroid sense if for any pair of edges or loop, there's a circuit that contains that pair. So for example, here's a, an M-connected graph because you, you take your choice of, of two loops, say two loops at the same vertex, here's a circuit that contains it, or two loops at different vertices, again, here's a circuit that contains it, et cetera, et cetera. One of these three circuits contains any pair you, you choose to, to pick. And we can turn, under the assumption of balance, redundant rigidity into M connected. The slight complication with the graph being connected as well. And the matroid connected implies the graph is connected, but redundant rigidity doesn't. So we had to add that in. And then you can use, um, I guess in 30 seconds, you can use this matroid connectivity to do something called an ear decomposition. So an ear decomposition says, let, let's say it talked about subgraphs, so have a, a list of, of subgraphs, the union of which is the whole graph, and so I put my first subgraph, which is gonna be one of my circuits, and then the second subgraph intersects it non-trivially, but has something new, and the third one intersects the union and has something new, et cetera, et cetera, and then there's a technical condition as well. But I'm gonna do this with, with circuits, and so I can, actually I can do this with just the rigid circuits and never have to worry about the flexible ones, which really simplifies it by looking at one type of circuit, not, not both. And then, for example, you can imagine how this is going to, to work out is that in your last circuit, there's something that's new. So there's something in that bit that's new, we're going to work there. And what we can show in that bit that's new, there's always a vertex of sufficiently low degree. 
and then we work with the, those low degree vertices. So we always have a vertex that looks like one of these, these bottom four, and we can always then do some operation that reduces them. So for example, this one here is exactly the operation I said for the, the bar joint case, but we need some extra operations that deal with the, the loops effectively. And with, with those operations, we can prove this result, which is the, the real technical um, part of the paper. So this takes like 15 pages or so, and I won't say anything more about it. But when you have this, um, this theorem, then you can do exactly the same proof technique as in the, the bar joint case. I had a couple more slides, but I'm going to stop there because I'm out of time. So thank you for listening. K13, is it three copies of K1? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, K13 means the complete graph in one vertex with three loops. Okay. So the superscript is the number of loops. Okay. Then why did you represent these uh, linear constraints with loops? Just because? I mean, you could have represented any uh, number of any other way. So, so I, I like to work with graphs, and, and so right. lo loops is a natural thing. That's all. I like the procedure and, you know, the, the way that you described the, the theorem with Jackson and the, the moves that are used to construct a proof uh, and an extension that you're using. Uh, that's something we haven't used in the past for any algorithm. And so I'm pondering what can be made out of that algorithmically. Have you thought in those terms? So the... The way, the way it works is that the, the hard thing is to say, I have, I have some big graph that's in the class and I want to reduce it. And so there the algorithmic question is not so obviously easy because I have a, a vertex. So I have a vertex like, like this one. It's not just one move because I have three options for where the, the edge goes in. Yeah. And so you may have to go down, go one and then test and it's wrong and go back and test. And so you can imagine yeah. there might be some sort of expansion I see. So it's not here. <laughs> but, but the, because the gra graphs characterize the, the class, and you can show that the, the class of graphs is polynomial, it's probably better to work like you do with Pebble Game kind of things yeah, yeah. directly. OK. Thanks again, Tony.